Join me in singing Power in the Blood. <laughs> We ask that this morning that you would hear our songs of praise and you would be pleased. But even more so, Father, that you would speak to each of us as individuals. Whisper in our ears the words you would have us to hear. Open our eyes to the things in this world that you are doing. And open our minds to the things that you would have us to do. We ask this all in your precious name today. Amen. Amen. If you have a hymnal, turn with me to page 328 and we sing, Are You Washed in the Blood? <laughs> Savior 
When they were showing the movie Forrest Gump, Shane always had a soft spot for the movie Forrest Gump, and, and he would watch it over and over, and well, I can't blame him. I watched it over and over too. And I have to admit, when I first saw it, I believed it was based on a true story. For, it was based on an actual person. But I soon figured out that it wasn't. You know, one person cannot be involved personally in so many historical events. And I realize now that the author was sticking his fictional character, Forrest, into the late 20th century's history of the United States. But there's one scene in the movie that confuses me a little bit. Forrest is, is left by the love of his life, Jenny. Lost and confused, he's sitting there pondering the future and contemplating the meaning of life, and he just up and starts running. He runs out the front yard, then he runs all the way through the county of Greenbow, Alabama. He runs to the East Coast. And then, just because he could, he turns around and he runs to the West Coast. And back to the East again. And he just ran and ran and ran. Then one day, he is running in what appears to be Monument Valley out in the, out in the southwest with a, a crowd of his faithful followers right behind him. And he stops for a second, just looking straight ahead. Then he turns around to the crowd of people following him. And he says this, I'm pretty tired. I think I'll go home now. As he begins walking through the crowd of his followers, one person, one of his faithful followers, one of his disciples, speaks up and says this. Now, what are we supposed to do? This scene reminds me of the passage in Acts that we will look at today. Matter of fact, when I read this passage, the movie Forrest Gump is what popped into my mind and took me back to the CBS Sunday Night Movies. In this scene in Acts, Jesus is standing on a mountaintop. What we know is the Mount of Olives. And he gives some final instructions to his disciples. And then, he just ascends to heaven. And as he ascends, I can hear the disciples thinking to themselves as they stare up into the heavens. As Jesus leaves them, now what are we supposed to do? And I'm reminded of this, not so much because of what Jesus said or, or did, or what he did not say, but more so because it makes me wonder, after all this time, did the disciples that were following Jesus really get it? Turn with me in Acts chapter 1, 
verses 6 through 14 and share with me in the reading of our sermon passage today. I'll give you a few seconds as, as you look this up. And, uh, well, this is what the writer says. So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? And he replied, it's not for you to know the time or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward the heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then the disciples returned to Jerusalem from, what, from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staring, staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. As you read this, questions rise. But let's begin <clears throat> by taking a look at what has been happening in the story of God to this point, specifically in the New Testament. Jesus came into the world as an infant. Out of fear for the child's life, after being warned by one of God's angels, the family heads to Egypt, where Jesus grew and learned. After Herod dies, and the threat is over, Jesus' family heads back to Nazareth. Jesus continues to grow and learn, and on one pilgrimage with his family, he's left behind at the temple in Jerusalem, and it's discovered a couple days later. The family goes back and gets him. Jesus says, what you know, I'd be in my father's house doing my father's business or something to that extent. And life happens quickly. And the next thing we hear from Jesus is at the age of around 30 years old. When he enters the water of the Jordan River to be baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. Jesus begins his earthly ministry and calls his 12 disciples to follow him. But many other disciples follow as well. Some follow because it's the popular thing to do. Hey, everybody else is doing it. But they do not get into the words of, of Jesus as deeply as the twelve chosen. After nearly three years of ministry, sharing God's word to the people, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, supplying the needs of the helpless, and giving hope to the hopeless, in an attempt to end Jesus' ministry, the leadership of the day, the Pharisees, the priests of the temple, the Roman leadership, they crucify Jesus. But Jesus, being God in flesh and blood, rises from the grave victorious over death and sin, bringing the opportunity for all of humanity to be forgiven of our sin. And after Christ's resurrection, he spends a few weeks, I think it's 50 days, clearing up, no, not 40 days, spending time clearing up some details of the disciples' confusion. And like the words of John 21-25 where the apostle states, but there are also many other things that Jesus did if every one of them were written down. I suppose that the world could not contain the books that would be written. There's so much that could be told but we don't have the time this morning. So we come to our passage in Acts, where we see the only detailed version of the ascension of Christ in Scripture. 
Jesus shares the Great Commission with his followers. We find that in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Jesus shares the Great Commission with his followers that says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey anything and everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus shares the Great Commission with his followers. And then somewhere in the discussion surrounding this commission, they ask, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, we people can become fixated on knowing the future. What is going on? What's going to happen? And, and even more prevalent, when will it happen? We want to know. A popular question we hear from time to time is, when will I die? And how will it happen? Some want to know, while others want it to remain a mystery. Myself, I think I'd rather have a mystery. But when it comes to Jesus' return, many want to know. And there are many who are willing to show their intelligence. And, and, and there are many who want to show they're so intelligent and share when these events will take place. But there's one detail that many times is forgotten by these people. Jesus' very own words, where he says, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. It's not for you to know. Jesus said this more than once. And also stated that even he does not know the time or place of his return. And now the question I always come back with is this. And, and this is the question I have to ask to those who try to predict when it's going to happen. If Jesus does not know the time and place, what makes anybody feel so arrogant that they think they can, that they are more informed than the Son of God himself and are able to predict the coming of Christ? You see, we do not know because we are not meant to know. We do not know because time is getting short and there's much work to be done. We do not know because if we knew the time and the place, we might get lazy and wait till the last hours to get the work done, the work of God. How do I know? Because we are very much the same. We are human. We are all human. Human nature is to do as little as possible until it is absolutely necessary. I know because that's how I was. When my mom said, we'll be home at this time, I said, what I want done, I would wait to the last minute and get it done. So when these men finished speaking, the disciples returned to Jerusalem. And they entered into a room in the upstairs where they devoted themselves in prayer. What does all of this mean? Well, I have a couple of questions that come to mind that may help us figure this out. First, why do we stand gazing at the heavens when the world is full of lost people? Why do we stand gazing at the heavens when the world is full of lost people? We live in a time and a place where there are many that are lost, many who are seeking the refuge of God, Many seeking mercy and grace only given by God. Many who are seeking forgiveness of the things they've done. And, and many who are seeking healing that is found only in Christ. We stand gazing at the heavens and hope for a sign that He's coming again. Well, let me say that we do not need a sign. Jesus said he would return. And I know that he will return someday to take his beloved church with him, to share eternity in his Father's house, our Father's house. When? We don't need to know the exact hour when and where. Just know that he is coming. We need to be busy doing the work that we have been commissioned to do. We don't need to know the time. We don't need to know the place. We only need to know that he's coming. And we need to be busy doing the work we have been commissioned to do. That's the first question. Question number two. Are you ready 
for the day when Christ will return. Are you ready for the day that Christ will return? To be ready for that day, we must be living our lives in accordance with Christ's teachings. Remember Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. In order for us to enter the kingdom of God, Jesus says in John 3, 7, that we must be born again. That whole discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus about how can a man enter his mother's womb again. That, that, that's a lot of discussion, but there's that five words that is key in that statement. We must be born again. Repent. We must repent. Turn away from the wicked ways that we have and turn to Jesus for forgiveness. That is what we need to do. Have you, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing flood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? What this lyric means is that if we want to spend eternity with Him in heaven, we must ask His forgiveness. We must believe that He hears us and that He has forgiven us. And then live according to His will, following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Part of that leading includes obeying the Great Commission. Each of us is commissioned to do these things. If we have received His forgiveness, then we are His disciples. Have you been doing that? Have you been doing what we've been told to do? Have you been following the Great Commission? Have you been doing what you have been commissioned to do? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Jesus said. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said so. And teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And then Jesus leaves one final word. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Have you been doing what you've been commissioned to do? Well, what, what is that? What are we commissioned to do? Well, if you read through this, this two, three, this paragraph in Scripture, it tells us we, what are we, we are called to make disciples. What are disciples? Disciples are people who follow our teachings. People who follow your teachings. So you are supposed to make disciples. So the question comes up, then what are you supposed to teach? We are to teach all the commandments and the teachings we have received from Christ. Now our children's lesson this week is about the greatest commandment. To love God and to love others, which in turn is to love God. We must be loving others, but we must be careful in, in our teachings. We must be careful not to share our own opinions, but the teachings of Jesus. Make sure that what we share is biblically sound. And in alignment with scriptures, which requires us to be in the Bible studying and, and praying and, and learning discipleship. We are called also to baptize these new disciples. Now, many of you are out there saying, well, I'm not qualified to baptize anybody. That's all right. But you need to teach them that it's their responsibility to be baptized. Well, let me take, take a moment here to say this. If you claim to be a disciple of Christ and you have not been baptized, you have unfinished business. Baptism is the outward sign of inward grace. Baptism is a demonstration of what the Lord has done for you in your heart. And if you also want to be baptized, you need to talk to me. We'll arrange it. We'll, we'll make it happen. I was planning a baptism service for Pentecost Sunday. That would be next week. Unfortunately, we will still be practicing our social distancing. But as soon as we are able to meet in our sanctuary, we will have a baptism service. We will have a fellowship dinner. And we will have a celebration of God's victory in this world. And I invite any of you who wish to be Jesus' disciples 
Those of you who want to be a disciple of Jesus and are not baptized, to be baptized on that day. All you have to do is get in touch with me. Let me know. And we can make some arrangements. Now there's one more question I have to ask before closing today. As, as Jesus ascended into he heaven, the disciples stood there gazing into heaven. And, and I can imagine them gazing with their mouths open like this. And then those guys in white robes show up and ask the questions. But why did the disciples, those who were present at the ascension, not begin to minister to the lost in their region? Remember, they, they returned to Jerusalem in the upper room where they devoted themselves to prayer. To be very honest, I don't have an answer to that question. But there is one possible reason that I can think of. At that point in time, they had not yet received the power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. They had not received the power of the Holy Spirit yet. Jesus breathed on them when he entered their room after his resurrection and said, Receive the Spirit. But they would not receive the full power of the Holy Spirit until Pentecostal Sunday, which we celebrate next Sunday. These disciples did not experience the Holy Spirit in the same way that we have. They had to wait for him to arrive. So they returned to, the, to Jerusalem and waited in the upper room, devoting themselves to prayer. I guess I have to ask another question. Have you devoted yourself to prayer? How is your prayer time? Do you have a prayer time? And, and during that time, what do you pray for? Do you take time to listen for his voice? His voice to speak to you? And if not... How will you know what the Lord is calling you to do if you're not listening for Him to talk to you? If you're not listening for Him to speak? Do you think He's going to show you a burning bush? I only know that happening once. Do you think an audible voice from heaven will boom out? I don't know. But the best answer for this is for you to be in prayer, devoting yourself to prayer, and listening for his voice. We must take time to listen. This is as much a part of prayer as lifting up our request. Even, maybe even more so. So I come back to Forrest Gump. Ending his long run and going home. And back to the one disciple who's asking the question. Now what are we supposed to do? And then I come back to Jesus' disciples. Staring into the heavens where Jesus is slowly disappearing. Can you hear them wondering, what are we supposed to do? As, as disciples of Jesus, He's made it crystal clear what we are supposed to do. We are to receive the Holy Spirit. We are to make disciples of all nations. And we are supposed to baptize those disciples. We're supposed to teach those disciples. All the commandments and teachings of Jesus. Is there really time to sit around and wait and watch the heavens for Christ's return? Take some time to assess your relationship with the Lord today. Are you living your life according to the teachings of Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus has forgiven your sins? Have you experienced the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you? Are you obeying the commandments? Love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Are you loving one another as Jesus has loved us? Remember he said, and I give you a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. And remember Jesus said there is no greater love than for one to lay down his life for another. Do you love that much? Are you making new disciples? Have you been sharing with others what Jesus has done for the world? Or have you been sharing with others what Jesus has done specifically for you? You need to be looking at the things that Jesus is doing in your life and things that you have seen Him do for you. And then you need to be sharing that because people are convinced more so on your personal experience than what you have read from a book. 
Have you been sharing with others what they need to do in order to be forgiven and to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ? And have you been sharing with others how we continue growing in wisdom and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Today I'm issuing a few challenges. If you're listening to these questions and answering no to any of them, make the necessary adjustments. Get your relationship with the Lord in the right. Devote yourself to prayer for your own spiritual growth. Study scripture. Get involved in a small group and, and discuss the scriptures. Learn from others as you teach others. Devote your actions to living according with, to the commandments of God. And devote your actions to the teachings of Jesus. And finally, devote your life to making disciples for Christ. Wherever you are, He's with you. No matter where you go, there He is. He's there guiding you and encouraging you. Encouraging you to speak the truth of His kingdom to those you encounter in the world. And to the question, now what are we supposed to do? Well, here's my answer to that question. Stop staring into the heavens. Stop waiting for His return. And get busy building the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. As we prepare to close this morning, would you sing the song, I Give You My Heart? I give you praise. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we are grateful, Father, for the blessings you've given us. We thank you for coming to this world and sending Jesus to walk amongst us, to teach us, to show us how to live a life pleasing to you. We thank you, Father, that he gave his life on a cross, that we might come to be in relationship with you, that our sins would be forgiven. So today, Father, we give you our heart and we give you our lives and we ask that you would lead us into this world, into the darkness of this world, into the places where your light is needed. Guide us, Father, as we enter into this, these places Guide us and lead us and give us words to speak. Encourage us with words that bring confidence. But most of all, Father, anoint us with your Holy Spirit today as we go into this world to make disciples of those we encounter all over the world or just in our community. Help us to be your light. Help us to make disciples. Help us to draw them closer to you. And this morning, Father, as we go, we ask your blessing upon each and every one of us. In your name we pray, in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the service, and I hope you have a great week, and join us again next week.